seen what fantastic things yeah. bivalves can do for a long part of the history of research on bivalves. We've learned <laughs> to be very humble because everybody thought they were very boring, but in about 1980, a whole new world opened up and, <laughs> new, and bivalves came into the limelight. And at almost exactly the same time, it was discovered that some deep sea bivalves, deeper water bivalves, were actually predators, carnivores. So we had two new feeding types uh, unearthed or, or revealed at the same time. And this was fantastic news for bivalve workers. It gave a, a whole new set of grant applications to lodge, <laughs> which were different from what had gone before. What I want to do is widen the whole um, discussion and show that there is a continuum of chemosymbiotic bivalves or chemosynthesis from very shallow water right down to the deep sea. There is not this division, oh, it's only the deep sea guys can work on this, but you can actually go and work on these things in very shallow water. Indeed, you can actually go and collect these animals at low tide without getting your feet wet, well, slightly damp, but not really uh, immersed. So there's fantastic opportunities. I first got into this, um, this subject when we dredged up this, this alien off uh, Western Australia. And at the time, I had no idea what it was, and it turned out to be a leucinid bivalve. Uh, totally new genus, totally new to science, and we called it, for obvious reason, Rasta. Now, it may surprise some of you, well, not all of you, but some of you, that there are nine separate families of bivalves that have chemosymbiosis. And the big ones, the brisicamides uh, here and Bacimodi, others have been mentioned already today, but some of the others are not. And surprisingly, uh, Eucinellidae, Montecutidae, Saxicavellidae, and Cufus here, that their sulfide oxidizing bacteria and chemosymbiosis has only been found in the last three years. So it just shows what we don't know. There's a whole diversity of bivalves out there, and only a fraction of them have been really studied in great detail. So it's actually quite an exciting time. Somebody said, well, maybe you're scraping the barrel, including these. But I say, no, it's an opportunity. We haven't really studied enough. Uh, all these bivalves have bacteria, which are usually gamma group um, proteobacteria, housed in special cells in the gills. They're not really green. I just love colouring these things in, like my granddaughter likes colouring in, in her paint books. And these are the, the different families I've lined up here, with some account of what, how many species we think there are at the moment that are actually chemosymbiotic within these different groups, and whether they're obligate or not, whether they're hydrogen sulfide, or whether methane, or whether hydrogen. I fortunately put that in at the last minute yesterday. <laughs> um, and by far the most diverse group having uh, with chemosymbiosis is the family Leucinidae. And that's what I spend most of my time working on, uh, our group, I should say. I was very impressed by Gillian's group of 20 people. We have a group of two. Um, and some of these, there are not many species recognized. This is because we haven't done any research on them. The Montecutidae and Saxicavellini, hardly anybody knows really what these things look like even. Um, and I expect a lot more uh, incident species in these areas. So we're looking at something that's actually very common and we're getting on for 800 species now recognized with chemosymbiosis. Uh, so it's really a common phenomenon and likely to get even more common in the future. Uh, only three of the four of the families seem to be obligate that all the specimens, all the individuals we've looked at have chemosymbionts of one form or another. Then the others, like the Thyosiridae, uh, some have chemosymbionts and others don't, and we don't know about these. There's some 
possibility that the very small Brassicomyidae might not be chemosymbiotic, but it's not published or proven yet. Now, we want to put these bivalves into some sort of evolutionary perspective. And this is the latest uh, molecular phylogenetic tree for all bivalves. It will be published next month. And it's the work of a group that I'm associated with, a multinational group. And we try to include bivalves from every single family in there. It doesn't matter about the detail, but what I'm going to do is plot on where the different chemosymbiotic groups appear. They're not appearing. <laughs> oh, yes, they are. Uh, so they're spread all over the phylogenetic tree here. So they're totally, on the whole, except one exception probably, unrelated to each other. So we know that the chemosymbiosis has evolved at least eight times separately. That's amongst living bivalves. And we don't include the fossil things that are possibly were possibly chemosymbiotic as well. I did notice when putting these on, there was a big gap in this area of the tree with no chemosymbionts. And I hadn't really thought about that before, but there we are. There is a, a gap amongst all these taxa here with no chemosymbiosis recorded. But uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then there's one I didn't put on six in the what we used to call tetradont bivalves in this part of the tree. And then right at the most primitive bivalve in our tree is Solomaya up here. And then a uh, little Eusinella, and then Bacchimodiolus here. So that's where they all fit together. There was an early hypothesis that maybe chemosymbiosis was primitive for bivalves and all the rest of the bivalves had lost it, leaving just these things here, but that's an untenable hypothesis. I'll go through some of these groups, just quickly reviewing them. You, we, we've heard very briefly about solomides um, this morning, but these are quite remarkable and they're really basal in all the phylogenetic trees. And these are some shallow water ones here. You can just see the red gill just inside here and they're very active they're thin shelled they're lightly calcified and they, they, they can swim and this is a part dissection here here's the gill at the back end here this is what it looks like on the SEM with multiple leaflets here in deeper water you get another group of solomides uh, which are loosely called acarax uh, and these are much more ribbed than, and they get really quite big and they get up to 25 centimeters long some of them uh, really remarkable things and some of them don't have a gut at all they don't have a mouth or a gut so they're totally dependent on the chemosymbiosis uh, Heiko Sarling had this little diagram of a, a hydrate gas hydrate whatever you call it a volcano? No. <laughs> a, a mound with gas hydrates underneath, and here's the acarax associated with it living down there, little burrows there. And if you chop open the gills here, you can see the bacteria all lined up in the gill filaments like sausages. Uh, absolutely wonderful things, coloured in again. And this is a view looking from the top down, as it were. So I carefully peeled this piece away. No, I didn't. It just broke off. <coughs> and although they have, they've only been studied carefully in a few species, how they live, they've got this Y-shaped burrow here, and they sit at this interface between uh, anoxic zone in the sediment and the oxic zone up here, and they draw in oxygen down there, and then they can move around in the burrow, maximizing the hydrogen sulfide uh, intake into the, the gills here. And they're very mobile. And don't forget, these are the most basal group in the evolutionary tree of bivalves. Fantastic. Long thought to be related to these is a group that we've, we've only proved that they're chemosymbiotic in the last couple of years, uh, Nucinellids. And notice the scale bar here. They're most species. We think there's about 30 species, 25, 30 species. Um, but undoubtedly, there are more to be described. Um, and they're all pretty well all less than five millimeters. Um, and they're very active as well. And they've got a, a gill here. 
and they live from intertidal, actually seagrass beds, intertidal down to about 4,000 meters, and oxygen minimum zone, some seeds, but they've been barely investigated. And they have, we had a very badly fixed specimen here, and we showed that they have the bacteria there, and this, this bacterium has now been sequenced, and it's gamma group proteobacteria. But a very interesting group. I, I actually love them, because you can get them all in one tiny little vial. <laughs> Uh, we've heard all about Batimoniolus in the last talk, and I, I mean, it was really wonderful. Um, but I'll just go briefly that we have the Batimoniolus, there's about 30 plus plus species. We don't know, as, as Gillian said, there's a dearth of taxonomists describing these things. They're actually sitting in museums and jars and everything, and not enough people working on them. And here they are at the classic vent sites. And I, I need to put this in. The, the remarkable thing is they have sulfide oxidizing bacteria, and some of them have methane oxidizing bacteria as well in the same cells, which is quite remarkable. And Sebastian Duperon <coughs> and his colleagues have shown that the numbers of the methane oxidizing and sulfide oxidizing, the populations in the cells, can change quite rapidly in response to fluctuating levels of, of the methane and sulf hydrogen sulfide in the water. And here you've got the red ones of the sulfide oxidizing ones and the green ones of the methane oxidizing. So I won't labor that for you. <laughs> it's been done beautifully already. Now there are other mussels, small mussels, that, uh, that were dredged up from deeper water associated with organic remains, wood, and whale bones, and all manner of things, organic things, these little mussels, uh, loosely called Idas or Edificola or, or Adula, Ad, no, Adulus, uh, anyway, couldn't be. And these also have chemosymbiotic bacteria, but they're not contained actually in the cells, they're extracellular. They're in between the microvilli on the surface of the cells here. Uh, so most of the symbionts are extracellular, as shown by Eve Southwood um, a few years ago. Now the question was, are all these things a monophyletic group, or have they evolved from mussels, shallow water mussels, on several different occasions? And in 2000, Dan Distel and some colleagues showed that all the ones that have symbionts are monophyletic in this tree. So this shows uh, the chemosymbiosis probably evolved only once here in, the, in, this, uh, in, in this clade. And this has been elaborated in great detail by uh, various French groups from Paris. Um, and this is a tree from Lorient et al. But what it shows is that the, the brown ones are the organic wood-associated things. The purple ones are vents and the blue ones are from seeps. And it shows that the seep and vent modiolids, fatty modiolids, have evolved several times separately here from ones from organic remains. So the seep and vent things are not monophyletic. Now that's done the mussels and the other things. Now we come on to the heterodonts, which are where I feel more happy. <laughs> and this is a heterodont tree we produced some years ago, and it shows where the chemosymbiotic species are placed in this evolutionary tree. Thiocyrids there, Lucinidae there, the sycamides down here, amongst the venerids. And somebody asked me the other day, why aren't there any deep water venerids? And I said, yes, there are. They're called the sycamides um, here, because they always come out next to the venerids in, in these molecular trees. And then we've got the other two things, that pteridinid, cupus, and then uh, montacutidae here. So I'll just review some of these now and see where we're going. The thiocyrids are perhaps the most diverse after the leucinids in deeper water. A lot of them are quite small and they're white and a lot of them are very boring looking. They all look like that and they all tend to look the same. They're very difficult to identify. 
but my colleague Graham Oliver at the National Museum of Wales is quite good at dealing with them. They have uh, a different anatomy. They have two hemibanks <coughs> on the gill and this strange foot, which is uh, used for burrowing in a minute, we'll show. There's, um, these occur at seep sites, these bigger ones, from Healy and this one from Heidel Depths. This is the thing the Japanese call Maori Fias. Uh, and it's a really deep water thing, 8,000 metres. Uh, it's not a Maori fire, it's a totally new thing. Uh, I don't quite know where it positions within the thiosiride. Now, the model of thiosiride uh, lifestyle, the chemosymbiotic ones, is they live at the interface of the oxidised and anoxic zones in the sediment, and then they probe down with the foot, producing these tunnels, and they draw uh, sulfide containing water into the mantle cavity and over the gills while retaining oxygen connection to the water above. The bacteria in many thiocyanides are not intracellular, they are contained in extracellular bags basically and they're all packed together in these bags here. This is the one from our from a vent site. Now, Suzanne Dufour in Canada, who's worked on these things a bit more extensively on their gills, and some are asymbiotic. Some have the bacteria in the, amongst the microvilli of the cell. Some have the bacteria contained in a bag, like the ones I just showed you. And some, like Conchakili, which I've never seen, and it's never been published properly, are contained in a vacuole within the cell. But I can't confirm that, because nobody's ever published it. That's thiosiridge. As I say, there's 100 species described, and Graham Oliver reckons there's probably 150 uh, plus waiting to be described. For Sycamidae, uh, as I said, they're closely related to shallow water Venus clams, Bongoli and so forth. And, uh, and the exciting discovery was Cryptogena on the Galapagos rise vents, and it caused great, great scurs in the bivalve world. Because although we've been working on bivalves for many years, most of us had never heard of the family Vesicomyidae. They were so poorly known from a few really grotty, worn museum specimens, half broken things that were sitting around in museum collections. And then suddenly we realised that these things here belong to that same group. And that was really quite exciting. And since then, uh, there's been a lot of descriptions by Eleanor Crilliver and colleagues and Rudo von Kozel and so forth. And there's about 100 species now described of all sorts of shapes and sizes, from very big things right down to very small things. So there's a whole diversity there. The first ones were living in these cracks on, in the basaltic areas on, on mid-oceanic ridges. And the model developed by Fisher and colleagues was that they, they sat in these crevices and poked their foot down into the sulphide-rich water immediately below. And the sulphides were um, absorbed through the foot and transported to the bacteria in the gills whereas they got oxygen from the water above through the ciliary flow from the gills for respiration. Uh, if we look at the way the gills are organised as a central blood space, and then we get these special cells, the bactericides, on either side in the filament, and these, all these holes here, peel the bacteria sitting in individual vacuoles. The funny, funny thing about, nobody's ever mentioned it, is that the sycamore bacteria are often very knobbly looking. You know, they look like little sort of flints <laughs> as you find on the beach down in down near Brighton. And the other the interesting thing about the sycamides is they have loads of um, hemoglobin. They're hemoglobin rich. Uh, I put two here. This is a proper dissection here. And this is one I got on the web and I think it was probably dissected by a chemist or something because <laughs> It's, it's a total pig's ear. <laughs> anyway. 
but the hemoglobin is used to transport the transport the sulfides from the foot to the gills and also involved in oxidation. Um, I've never quite taken with the, the foot absorption hypothesis because we've got all the bacteria in the gills and you've got the filtering system coming in and washing over the gills. Uh, but I, I talked to these people about it and they're quite convinced of it. But as I said before, we've got all sorts of funny shapes, of a uh, whole range of shapes and sizes for zikomides now. And this is from um, off West Africa, a seep, and there are two genera of the sycamides here, living side by side. There are the ones poking up here that don't have any siphons, and they're just sitting in the sediment here. And then there's the other genus here uh, with long, long siphons, and they're, they're deeply buried. You know, so this the sycamide is doing two completely different things, living side by side. So there's much more, there's great potential for more work, I think. We come on to leucinids, which I spent most of my time on. There are about 400 species, as we say, um, and they occur from the intertidal down to about 2,600 meters. And there's a huge diversity of shapes and sizes. Oops. And again, they have these big gills with, uh, with the bacteria in special bacteria sites. And um, here's a section here, central blood space, and then the bacteria sites with the, with the bacteria in special vacuoles. This is their mode of life. They sit on the boundary between the anoxic and the oxic zone, and they probe down with the foot, and they draw in sulfides into the mantle cavity over the gills. They live in a huge variety of habitats from mangrove mud, sea grasses, rubble, coral reef lagoons. Amazingly, we've got 18 species out of this lagoon here, uh, oligotrophic waters, uh, hydrocarbon seeds, and mud volcanoes, and lately, sunken wood. And there's one found at a sedimentary vent on the Kermadec Ridge. Although we've got 400 species, what we this is an illustration of what we don't know. Emily Glover and I have been working on a fauna from the central Philippines uh, collected by the, the Paris group, intensive sampling down to 1,000 meters and more. And they gave us all their material to work on. And this is the depth zonation of, of all the species. We've got 15,000 specimens we worked through. And the ones with red dots are the new species. And that's an illustration of what we don't know. This is just in the central Philippines. Uh, what diversity there is in the total Indo-Pacific, we really don't know. <laughs> what we've been looking at recently is the origin of the deep water things, deeper than 200 meters, so we say. And this is a phylogenetic tree with no names to protect the innocents. But the most of the deeper water taxa that we've been able to get hold of are in this part of the tree with the scattering from other parts. Now the one, the one we got from a vent sits here. But what I want to talk about briefly in the last few minutes I've got is the Lucinoma group here, clade here. And these are deep water things that go down to 2,500 meters. They're common at seeps, oxygen minimum zones, and so forth. But there are two, two neighboring groups in the tree here. They're very shallow water, coral reefy, seagrass things. Uh, this is very odd. Here's the Lucinomas. There are about 30 species in the genus. But nearly 45% have been described since year 2000. And Amazing thing is, they're really anoxia tolerant. This, uh, you know, one of them, yeah. Equizonata here. The experiments have been done in California in uh, uh, Felbeck's lab that they can survive half the population in their sample, which can survive total anoxia for at least 270 days. They got rid of all the oxygen out of the experimental system. And these animals were still alive and burrowing at that time. They're quite a remarkable tolerance of terrible conditions. 
And then the Lucinomas go down from quite shallow water down into, well, a bit deeper than this now. And the ones that are associated with seeps and actually in minimum zones. But my guess is that these were just dredged up randomly, some of them, that they're all going to be associated with seeps of some sort. Two new discoveries by Graham Oliver in the last year or so. There's, um, there's a funny little bivalve that lives on echinoid bums here. There it is. And that turns out to have uh, bacteria in the gills. No, no for sure whether they're sulfide oxidizing, but we'll guess that they are. Uh, maybe more in this group. And then another one that Graham published last year, uh, Saxi Cabellini. Uh, hardly anybody knows what they are. I wouldn't recognize one if I'd seen one. And they again have bacteria in the gills. So there's potential there. This is an indication of what we don't know all the time. And then down distal went looking for this weird shipworm that doesn't live in wood, it lives in mud, and they get to, you know, two meters long. And uh, most shipworms have cellulolytic bacteria. Um, to help digest the wood that they feed on. But this one lives in the mud, and it doesn't ingest wood, but it has sulfide oxidizing bacteria. Unfortunately, I haven't published it yet. It's just in an abstract at the meeting in 2012. But more potential there. How am I doing? <laughs> Two minutes, right. <laughs> um, why bivalves? Why are bivalves so good at chemosymbiosis? Well, I think the answer is the gills. You've got the ciliary currents setting up to pump water into the mantle cavity uh, and they're adapted for uptake of oxygen already, but they're also uh, uptake of sulfides and there's integrated blood transport all built in. And there's this plasticity of the gill filaments to house the bacteria. It's just incredible what the bacteria do in the housing of the gills. The gills are really enlarged as a result of the bacterial, I call it an infection in a way, this is an infection, what happens to the morphology of the gill? Um, oh, this is by Childress and Gergudius. I just pass on, I'm running out of time. Yeah. This is um, John Allen in 1958. This is a cross-section through a normal gill filament of filter-feeding bivalve. And I've, these are homologous bits here. And this is a leucinid. And what happens is this area here is expanded enormously. So the, that's the, that bit and that bit. So this area in the middle is expanded enormously. And this happens as soon as the bacteria infected into the mantle cavity of the, of the newly settled bivalves. They start producing these bacteriocytes. And the bacteria induce the bivalve to proliferate these bacteriocytes. Now that's a big question, is how this interaction between the bivalve and the bacteria is, is adapted here. This is one of the great questions. Incidentally, uh, in 1958, John Allen dotted all the bacteria here, illustrated them, but he called them pigment granules because he wasn't expecting bacteria. Fossil history, we got a I have to mention it briefly, as it's a geological society. We've got the time ranges of these different major groups. The Sycamides and the Bacchimodiolids are really only in the Cenozoic, early Cenozoic onwards. But the Solomides and the Lucinids go back way into the Paleozoic here. Um, so there's a long history, uh, and the shapes are the same, and the muscles are the same, and the anatomy was obviously organized in the same sort of way. So we believe that they were chemosymbiotic right down into the lower Paleozoic here. And these are some examples of Devonian Lucinids. Uh, this was regarded as the earliest Lucinid from the upper Silurian, late Silurian, until uh, we just found this last year. This is from the Ordovician, and we're pretty convinced that this is uh, the earliest Lucinid yet found from, uh, from the upper Ordovician of Girvan. Solomides are much more difficult because they got very fragile shells and they tend to break up even in recent collections in museums. But these are from the Miocene. And this is one claimed by John Cope as the earliest Solomide from the lower Ordovician of Wales. Quite honestly, 
if you look at it in the real and in different lights, you can convince yourself that it really is a solar mire. Uh, taxonomic activity has been stimulated by the discovery of symbiosis, this huge increase in the number of species described in Vesicomide since the discovery, and then in Lucines, this upward curve here, which is going to go into space, I think. The main conclusion is that uh, chemosymbiosis is really common. It's evolved independently many times and occurs in a widespread range of habitats from the intertidal down to the very deep sea. So it's a continuum. It's not just work on deep sea, we don't just work on seeps, we, we work on all these things considerably. And there's escalating discoveries all the time. New things are being found constantly. It's very difficult to keep up with them. And just my acknowledgments. My colleagues, Emily Glover, who I work with closely on Lucinids, and Suzanne Williams, who does the molecular work.